Welcome back to my course on literary theory. In this lecture, I will be covering Marxist literary crit criticism or Marxism. And I'll first introduce you to certain basic concepts and ideas of Marx and other Marxist scholars, and then move on to discuss how these concepts play out as we apply them to literary and other texts. So Marxism, pretty much everyone knows that most of what we call Marxism is based in originally the ideas of Karl Marx and is derived from majority of his work. But there are some major ideas from Marx's work that play an important role in our understanding of Marxism. And the first and the most important to understand is Marx's view of history. Okay, how does he imagine history? And what the term for that is that for Marx, history is an agonistic process. So he has then simply stated an agonistic view of history. Now, what does that mean? If we look up agonistic, it means conflictual. So his view of history is that history doesn't just move on from the past to present, but it's a history of struggle in which different classes compete for their interest. And some win and some lose, but overall the history of the world is history of this class struggle. That's the first thing about Marxism to keep in mind. Then his theorization of class, and that's crucial. Okay, the way Marx theorizes class is peculiar because what he is theorizing that the material conditions, it's the material conditions that shape our consciousness, that shape the man, as he says, and not the other way around. The consciousness doesn't shape materiality. The material conditions shape our grounded consciousness. So why is that crucial to understand in theorization of class? Because if we could agree with this proposition that material conditions shape our identities, our subjectivities, our consciousness, then people who share the same material conditions will roughly have the same kind of consciousness and hence could constitute a class, right? So based on, based on this brilliant insight, Marx can then theorize different classes, the proletariat, the working classes, right? And the bourgeois, the, the middle class, the rich middle class, and the nobility. But this theorization of class is really crucial in understanding for, uh, Marx. And then is the Marx's idea of the architecture of the society. Now, what is the hierarchy, general hierarchy at a, any given political space, right? And that he defines through base and superstructure. Base is often also called infrastructure, right? So at the top of every society, according to Marx, is this dominant ideology, dominant group enforced through police, through force, through law, and even through arts that determines the life for the base, which is the workers, the proletariat. Now, Marx would also say that in the last in instance, it's the base that determines the superstructure, but we can't get into that here because it's too complex a debate. But so the model is pretty architectural. There is the superstructure and the base or the infrastructure. And it's the superstructure whose ideology is usually dominant. And that brings me to the next really important concept in Marx, and that is ideology. Now, the way Marx explains ideology is what we call the epistemological model of ideology. Okay, And what do we mean by that? The epistemological model of ideology, epistemology, the philosophy of knowing, the question in this model is, can we know the truth? So the idea is that ideology perpetuated by the dominant classes, right, by the superstructure, masks or veils the sight 
of the workers, of the proletariat, to a point that when they look at the world, they see it from the point of view of their oppressors, from the point of view of the dominant classes. So the purpose of revolution, a Marxian revolution, then is to lift that veil, right? So that people could actually see the truth. And if they did, then they will, of course, overthrow their oppressors. But that is the epistemological model of ideology. And even though I have not discussed Althusser, I should now point out that Louis Althusser, about whom we, I'll talk briefly, his idea of ideology is slightly different. And he has a structuralist model of ideology. And what his view is, because he's a post-structuralist or structuralist, that we are all born in ideology. There is no outside to it. Our subjectivity is created within ideology. Okay, So the, there is no possibility of removing the veil of ideology, because ideology is a large structure. All we can do then within a given ideology is, is to shift our ideologies from one to another. But that's a distinctive difference between Marx's epistemological model of ideology and Louis Althusser. Then there is the concept of alienation, very crucial in Marx. So what is, simply speaking, what is alienation? We, I mean, we use this term every single day, right? He is alienated, she is alienated. That's why he or she is doing those terrible things. We use the term alienated youth, right? It's the same sense in which this term is used, but what Marx is theorizing and does theorize is that human beings, by their very, their very nature, are productive beings. They love to make things. Now, if they are producing or making things that they love to make and think, then they are, dis they, they are reconciled with what they are meant to do. But in capitalism, you go and do whatever you have to do, you know, to make a living. Most of the times, the things that you're doing, working in a restaurant, you know, like digging ditches or even teaching may you may not like it so that means you are dependent on something that you absolutely cannot relate to and hence that will make your soul sick and make you unhappy and you will be alienated so labor is alienated one because it has to do repetitive things that it has no love for and two the commodities that it produces most of the times it may not even be able to afford it right so that's the concept of alienated labor. So the revolutionary response to that is to disalienate labor, is to reconcile people with what they love to do, right? And then, and so there is a certain degree of humanism involved here, right? Because Marx does imagine this idealized humanism, commodity, right, that we can use every now and then. So. That's the concept of reification, right? And then we go to two very important concepts that are not originally Marxian concept, but they come from a Marxist, right? And those are dominance and hegemony. Okay, so I do have a lecture on it on my YouTube channel, and I'll post it below this video as an extra resource. But the concept of dominance and hegemony, these two concepts were theorized by uh, Antonio Gramsci, who was an Italian Marxist, right? And simply stated, the hegemo hegemony is that in a given political regime, the dominant group doesn't always work through oppression, but rather tries to build a hegemonic system within which they do things, the dominant group would initiate policies or perform actions that enables them to get the willing consent of the people, the willing consent that the dominant group can govern them. And that is the hegemonic project of power, right? And dominance, of course, is when the state or the dominant group uses brute force, police, law, justice, immigration to control people, to bend their will to its use. But most of the times, political systems work through the hegemonic projects. Now, here is where Althusser, Louis Althusser, becomes crucial. 
in one of his probably the most important essays in 20th century, it, which is entitled Ideological and Repressive State of Pra Practices, Althusser uses Gramsci's theorization of hegemony and dominance to theorize that in modern capital, power no longer, state no longer works through dominance alone. It's there, the threat of violence by the state is there, the police is there, the justice system there is there, but most of the time the state creates its hegemony through the educational system, right? And the reason he's explaining these things is in the beginning of his essay, he gives us two things that a capitalist society must do, right? One, it must constantly produce commodities to sell, right? Because without that, capital cannot exist, right? Without that exchange. The second thing that a capitalistic society must do is it must reproduce itself. What does that mean? That it must produce the mode, reproduce the mode of production. It needs doctors, engineers, workers, people like me, you know, people making pieces. All of these are cogs in the machine of capital, and the system must reproduce themselves. Now, you live in free societies, though, so the system can't tell you, you know, your, your father was a bricklayer, you will be a bricklayer too. No. How do people hegemonically, without having been coerced into it, accept their role in society, right? That is done through ideological state of practices. So for Althusser, there are ideological state of practices and repressive state of practices. But reproduction of the capitalistic society happens through ideological state of practices, and the best instrument of that is the educational system, because it internally convinces us about our place in the world, our place in society. So if you're a high school dropout, chances are there are certain jobs you won't even apply for because you've internalized that you don't have the credentials. If you're a high school graduate only, there will be certain jobs you'll be fit for, you will fill them in. You're a college graduate, depending on your major, you'll fill another tier of the demand of workers, and that is how the capitalistic society hegemonically, without forcing anyone or without coercing anyone, fills different spots within its machine, right? Now, most of the time we think these are actions are not coerced, but so many times materially we are forced to make these choices. But these, this is the distinction that Louis Althusser makes, right? Ideological state of practices and repressive state of practices, and that the modern economies or modern polities are such that they don't need to openly use force. Most of the times, they use hegemonic means, right? Another concept is, uh, is important concept is vanguardism. So in early Marxism, the question was, okay, how does labor become aware of its own exploitation? How do we know, how does workers, how do workers know that they are exploited, right? And the idea was well, like, okay, would they become aware of it themselves, but then if they are so ideologically imbricated, maybe not. So that's when Lenin develops this idea of vanguardism, and what that means is that a vanguard of intellectuals and others will emerge in the political movement, and then their job it would be to teach the workers their lived experience and what's going on, right? And eventually, the communist, the central communist party takes on that role of the vanguard, or the, that didactic role. But this tradition lives on in Marxism, and you can see we, the, the leftist groups still do teach-ins, they do social meetings, they do pedagogical meetings. But the idea was how to how do the workers learn of their own exploitation and learn of the revolutionary potential of their own position in the world. Another concept that often comes up in Marxism is that of dialectical materialism, and a lot of people find it deeply intimidating, but it's not really a hard concept to understand if you know a bit of Hegel. Right? Now the Hegel is the one who uses the dialectic in his um, grand, grand work, and what is Hegelian dialectic, right? The purpose is to reach the absolute truth, and you are trying to do it through reason, 
right? So he says, okay, I'm going to take one idea, that's my thesis, and I am going to think it to its limit until it reaches its other, which is the antithesis, right? Then I'm going to subsume that antithesis into the thesis, whatever I can subsume, whatever corresponds to my thesis, and I'm going to create a synthesis. Right? Then that synthesis will become a thesis, and I'll find its antithesis, and keep repeating the same process until I have reached the top of the pyramid, right? the truth. Now that's Hegelian dialectic. It's ideological, because you're working with ideas. And those ideas lead you to the top of the triangle, where there is only one idea, the absolute truth, that can exist. Now Marx, and he mentions it in, I think, third edition of Capital Volume 1, or even the first one in the preface, he says, I have inverted the Hegelian dialectic. We know one truth, that the material world exists. Right? So. Dialectical materialism is then here, from here, where we are, how do we explain how we got here historically, right? In order to do that, we can't just rely on new ideas. We have to find out what modes of production existed before this time. So dialectical materialism then looks at shifting modes of production Okay, it's feudalism. If it's feudalism, this is the kind of system it creates. If that system is created, then because of that, this new mode of production emerges. So it's dialectical materialism because you're still seeking the opposite of each material condition, but you're not just relying on ideas, but actual material conditions in the world. And as they keep competing with each other, ultimately capitalism arises. But your approach is historical and materialistic because you're dealing with shifting modes of production and how they impact life. So that's dialectical materialism. Now, before I go into like a little bit of how we use this, this knowledge, there is another branch of Marxism very prominent even at this point, which, um, which is called, um, you know, compositionist or workerist Marxist. And these are scholars like Franco Berardi, Carlo Versilone, these are the people who have their lineage with, um, you know, Antonio Negri and then before that, Antonio Gramsci, right? And the workers basically suggest that, well, it's not the workers who react to changes in capital. It's capital that reshapes itself as workers get more organized and ask for more rights. And then that's the assumption they rely on, which then means that if workers come together and think capitalism again, they can force capital to change. But it's a really important movement, and I highly recommend that you should read at least Frank, uh, Franco Berardi's The Soul at Work. That's a beautiful book, and it will help you understand the contemporary world really better. So, I mean, as I said, Marxism is a huge topic. It cannot be covered in one lecture. So how do we use it in reading literary works? I mean, first is the very obvious. Like, we can look at the class structure within a text and see whose worldview is being privileged in a text. Is it the workers or is it the capitalists? I mean, if you read the Atlas Shrugged, right, from a Marxist point of view, you already know that that text very obviously is telling us that the world belongs to all these rich, hard-working people, right? And you, me, and others who work and sometimes maybe rely on the safety net or the moochers, right? So one way we can read a text to find out whose point of view is it privileging. Does it challenge the bourgeois middle class? The term for that is bourgeois. Does it challenge any of the bourgeois assumptions? Is it a revolutionary text, right? Uh, beyond that, uh, you know, what kind of mode of production is represented in a text and what does it do to the consciousness of people? What kind of solidarities are being offered in a text and whether they are useful or not? So if you have this knowledge, right? If you see a TV show which represents unions as these evil people, you can already, through your Marxist analysis, point out just by watching a snippet of that show that this show 
is normalizing this negative view of labor and is probably pushing the agenda of the dominant capitalistic group. So these are some of the things that we can do with Marxism. In real life, if you think in material terms, in Marxist terms, then you can look at people and not just judge them for who they are and all, but also plot them against the exploitative system in which they work and then say, wow, this person works really hard, 10 hours a day, right? But he or she is still struggling. That is a Marxist reading of workers' struggle, right? Beyond that, then you can also read it in texts or in real life, the inequities and inequality, the redistributional inequalities that exist, that some people can do little and can be enormously rich, and some people work all their lives and just barely you know, persist, uh, can just barely subsist. All of these are not individual faults. These are systemic, and that reading of that system, its materiality, how does it work, how are laws made, who do, do the laws privilege, all of this can be covered under the umbrella of a Marxist reading. Now, one of the greatest American scholars of Marxism, uh, Frederick Jameson, in the beginning of one of his books, Maybe I'll do a lecture on the book itself, uh, which is called Political Unconscious, starts by saying that the one purpose of this book, and I'm paraphrasing here, that one purpose of this book is to suggest that Marxism is the absolute horizon of literary criticism. Now, I'm not going to claim that, but I think if you use these insights and augment them with your own reading, a materialistic Marxist readings of text, can enable you to find out the biases of the text, to find out what the text is privileging, but it can also enable you to think the world differently and to think of people in it and the systems in it maybe differently, maybe with a more just world in mind. So that's all I have to say about Marxism. I will post additional resources to this lecture, but I hope this was useful to you. As always, if you have any questions, please send them my way and please keep following this course and I will see you next time with a new, a new lecture. Thank you and goodbye.